Hello. The 21st century is only a few months old, yet already the first history has been written. The eminent historian Eric Hobsbawm's book, The New Century, comes out next week. But is it really possible for history to tell us something about an era which has hardly begun? Can we ever predict the future by understanding the past, often used as the justification for studying history? Should we seek to understand the past because it holds important lessons for the future? Or is history, as Henry Ford would have it, more or less bunk? With me to discuss the history of the future is Richard J. Evans, Professor of Modern History at the University of Cambridge, and author, among much else, of that clarion call of a book, In Defence of History, and I'm also delighted to welcome Eric Hobsbawm himself. Eric Hobsbawm, in a new century you've written... Let us hope that the 20th, 21st century will experience further progress, but without the catastrophes. But if there are catastrophes, they'll be different as a result of the 20th century. Has humanity ever really learned from the past and been able to apply the lessons? They've always tried. Uh, in the past, of course, people learnt because there was a mechanism by which, in effect... Uh, knowledge of the past and how things were done in the past uh, was passed on from one generation to the other and until the 19th and 20th century basically that was a model of how things should happen at least for most ordinary people so to that extent learning from the past was built in almost wired into uh, human life the novelty of the situation that we have to discuss is in the 19th and 20th century, when the future simply is not based on the, on the past, we, we, we don't repeat, it's going to be very different, and we've got to try and find out how it's going to be different. When you say the future isn't... Can you just extrapolate a little more on that before we go on? Well, <clears throat> let's put it like this. For most of the world, say until the middle of the 20th century the greater part of humanity lived on the land and by agriculture, one way or another. Even the big industrial countries, with one or two exceptions of England, the United States, Germany, a very high percentage of the people continued to be in the country. Today, this is simply no longer so. It is a purely regional problem. We've got to get used to a future in which only 2 3%, even less of people live uh, by farming, by agriculture, where the country, countryside is completely different from what it ever was before. A again, in the past, uh, education, literacy, was something which was a minority activity, except among certain special groups. Secondary education was a tiny fraction. Tertiary education, students, ridiculous. I mean, when we talk about the students' role in the 1848 revolution, we're talking about three, 4,000 people in Europe, or at least in Germany. Today, we, we are in a completely different ballgame. And therefore, the past, though it gives us some guide, only gives us a very, very partial guide. Richard Evans, can we distinguish uh, different sorts of the past, as it were? Presumably in law we learn from the past, common law, that case is based on the previous case, and so the next case uh, is answered accordingly. That's one way we learn from the past, which accretes. There are certain ways in which we do learn from the past because of that sort of process. Can you distinguish ways in which you think we, we are learning from the past and ways in which we're taking a flyer? Well, even in law, I think... Um, uh, judges of, uh, and people have always been fairly creative in interpreting precedents. Uh, I remember there's a, a legal definition in the Middle Ages in England of custom from time immemorial that says uh, that it's anything that's been going on for more than 21 years, I think. Um, so I don't think one should, should uh, uh, underestimate the extent to which people in the past have been able to adapt and, and, and change. But there's, there's no doubt that things are, are moving faster, that, that, as Eric says, education literacy, globalization of communications, the instantaneous nature virtually of the, of the internet, of television, radio, mean now that people can learn, adapt and change much faster than, than ever before. And from, to, to that extent, I think, um, the past and, uh, and custom and precedent are becoming less important. So what would you say to people who say, look, it's important to study history because a knowledge of the past give, informs the present and gives you some idea of the future? Would you, I'll come to Eric in a minute, but you're a professor of modern history at Cambridge, these students come up, and that's certainly one of the things they might reasonably think or have been told by their teachers. Well, I would say, first of all, that's not the only reason to, to learn history, and perhaps not even the most important one. 
um, that uh, the, the most important, I think, thing about learning history is to study past societies, and they can be as remote as, as you like. It doesn't really make that much difference, um, because even if you go back uh, 100 years into the, the, the late 19th, the end of the 19th century, society was so different, values were so different, people were so different, that it takes an enormous effort of the imagination to, to understand them. And by, as we're visiting and understanding societies removed from us in time, I think we can learn more about what it is to be human, the human condition, the possibilities of human behavior. Um, learning directly from, from the past um, has often been done in the... Uh, French Revolution, for example, uh, was full of parallels with the, the fall of the, the Roman Republic in, in, the, in ancient Rome. Um, the, the many institutions which it established... Did they learn from that, or did they reach out and grasp them as justification for what they were doing? Well, of course, they thought they, they were learning, and, and, and the problem is that um, it's a very, very tricky thing to do. People have often learned the wrong lessons. Take the, the Russian Revolution in 19... 17. Um, uh, everybody, when Lenin was departing from the scene, thought that, uh, as with the French Revolution, a Napoleon figure would come up and turn it into a dictatorship, and they all identified Trotsky, who was the, uh, the, the, the leading figure in the Red Army, and uh, so they conspired against him and got rid of him, and, of course, they neglected the real threat, which was uh, Stalin, the quiet bureaucrat, and there, there are plenty of examples of, of people learning the wrong lessons, so I think one has to be very cautious about this, in terms of politics, at least. Eric Hobsbawm, can you see some situations in the 20th century from which we can learn for the 21st century? Could maybe the Russian Revolution is an example? Any, anything, any, any big event? or? Well, uh, to some extent, uh, we need to learn from the past because uh, the other ways of predicting the future have turned out to be no good at all. If you actually look at the amount of resources which are devoted by governments, by economists, by corporations to predicting the future, uh, and the net result has been pretty negative. In fact, I would have thought probably over the past 40, 50 years it's become worse than it used to be, for, partly for the reasons that we were discussing earlier on. So the only way that you can really do it is to find out how things got to be the way they are now and to see whether conceivably this gives you a guide to where they're going to go. For instance, the case of globalization, you see, which is not something which happens suddenly even when it accelerates tremendously, as it has recently done. What actually has been happening to globalize the world over the past, let's say, 150 years? That, I'm sure, does give us a guide. Um, there are a number of other things, namely that we in our trade uh, are supposed to remember what other people forget or have never known. And that's a very useful thing. Uh, you know, people have been saying things about the Balkans, which have been the basis for policy, um, which most historians who knew about it uh, knew were nonsense. Uh, they knew the Balkans weren't like that at all. And... Um, so uh, it does help to know what happened last time. It helps, for instance, very much to know what mistakes were made after 1918, after the First World War, because an enormous amount of the political problems today are still, as it were, the chickens of the Treaty of Versailles coming home to roost. While agreeing, uh, uh, James, while agreeing that, that one can learn from the past in that way, perhaps learn what happened, certainly, say the Treaty of Versailles is a very good example, do you think that that learning is ever applied, or do you think that events and circumstances change so quickly that by the time you've learned the Treaty of Versailles, the Second World War is on you? Well, it certainly is applied. Whether it's usefully applied is another matter. And the big lesson that um, many states and politicians in Western Europe learned of the Treaty of Versailles was uh, appeasement, was that um, it was essentially wrong. It was re repudiated and criticised almost as soon as it was signed. And everybody thought that you should... You should um, have, uh, give in to um, Hitler's demands in the 1930s because the Treaty of Versailles had perpetrated an injustice in Germany. And I think this skewed people's perceptions of what Hitler and Hitler's foreign policy were, was actually about. 
Um, and another example, very good example, is the current West German, the current, the original West German, now the German Constitution, which is based to quite a large extent on a theory of vi why the Weimar Republic collapsed. Uh, for example, the excessive power of the president, so you have a president who has no power, um, and the um, proliferation of small fringe parties, so you now have to get 5% uh, of the vote in Germany in order to be represented in parliaments and so on. And on the whole, that seems to have worked, though whether the, the theory of uh, a historical theory in which it's based is a correct one is, is, is another matter. So certainly people do look to the past and do... Um, actually apply its lessons in, in policy making. Because this, the, the question looking to the past begs the other question of whose past is it and what past you're looking to, doesn't it? Yes, what, what do you mean exactly? By well, that, I mean it? there's different ways to interpret the uh, Treaty of Versailles, there's different ways to interpret what happened in the 30s in Germany. I mean, it, from different perspectives, different historians in different countries at different ages uh, will say this is what really happened then, these are the lessons we draw then, these are the lessons we draw then, and as centuries go on, different lessons are drawn. Absolutely. Um, um, everybody, of course, um, politicians, um, historians themselves, argue about the, the past. And uh, in order to apply the lessons of the past, you have to have some th theory about the past which is going to be disputed by someone else. Well, let's take the Russian Revolution, which you brought up, the 1917 Revolution. Um, Eric Hobsbawm, I mean, there are, there, are, there, are, there are different lessons that can be drawn from that, aren't there, wouldn't you say? Certainly, there are always different lessons to be drawn, but uh, that depends to some extent on what you want to find out about. What is it you want us to draw lessons about? Exactly, but I mean, that means that the historian is in the position of being as much a sort of a commentator and a biased figure as a, a, a person who is sort of monkishly devoted to finding out the uh, the real, as it were, in inverted commas, truth. I mean, given that monks were often writing on the side of the <laughs> of the victorious, anyway. We're limited to some extent by the rules of our game, you might say. You know, there are some things you can establish and some things you can't establish on the basis. It's a little bit like courts of law, you know. There are rules of evidence, there are rules of logic, and so on. So consequently, uh, I mean. Richard there has got a lot more experience of this in practice than I have, you see. Uh, when somebody puts forward a proposition about the past, <coughs> you can sometimes say, this is simply not so. In other cases, you have to argue. Uh, now, historians are limited by this. The real problem, it seems to me, for them is when we deal with the 20th century, our own time, where we are both operating by the rules of our own game and by, you might say, uh, our beliefs, our deepest passions. And the two may not always run side by side. We've just come through a century which is essentially a century of wars of secular religions. Uh, and it's often extraordinarily difficult uh, to forget, to treat our own time as though we were talking about, let's say, the 17th century. Uh, in some cases, we are simply too close to it to be able to do it. In the case of the Russian Revolution is, 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 is a case in point. There is nobody, for instance, at the moment, virtually everything that is written about the Russian Revolution is either still denunciation or not so much exculpation today, mostly it's denunciation, but in other words, it is not a proper historical approach to it. You can chase this up, for instance, recently a major life of Lenin has been written by a man who has genuinely tried to do it as a balanced Robert Service. The reception of this book has been purely Lenin as the ancestor of Stalin. This is not what the author wanted, but this is the way, inevitably, under the circumstances, the book is read, including by the specialist reviewers. It's terribly difficult to get clear, even for things that are 50 years back, like the Nazis. It is still terribly difficult to emancipate yourself from the, nest, the strongest feelings which we all have. That was I was seeking <coughs> to, to clarify earlier. Would you agree with that, Richard? Yes, I, I do think that's the case, that just in simple terms of the documentary evidence that becomes available, 
um, the fall of communism, for example, has released an enormous flood of, of documents in, in uh, the former Soviet Union in Moscow. The KGB archive was full of German, even French material that we knew nothing about before. Uh, and new documents continue to be, um, become available. And that does, of course, change our knowledge and improve and increase our knowledge of, of the fairly recent past. And also, of course, in terms of perspective, with the more we know about what happened after the events that we're studying, the more we can put them in, in, in a balanced perspective. Can, we talk, can I talk about <coughs> a specific uh, notion here? What, what's your, do you think that the... Have you detected a decline in the nation-state? Do you think the nation-state, given what Eric Hobsbawm brought up earlier about globalisation being gathering pace over the last 150 years, uh, is, 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 is a consequence of that that the nation-state will diminish in force? What's your view on that? Because a lot of people think it will, and is indeed. People have been predicting the decline of the, the nation-state for much of the 20th century, and in a way, one of the most surprising things um, about it is the, is the resilience of the nation-state. Even institutions which, uh, at first sight, you might think look as if they're superseding the nation-state, like the European Union, turn out on closer inspection to um, really be run by nation-states in the interests of, of nation-states. It's the, it's the Council of Ministers that calls the shots in, 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 in the last analysis. Um, that having been, been said, um, I think the globalization of, of, of big industry and big business is undermining the nation state in a more um, profound way, probably, than multinational institutions are doing. Um, but even there, I, one can detect, uh, even in terms of uh, um, international institutions, uh, one can detect, I think, um, an increasing um, international intervention in the affairs of the nation state. In terms of justice, for example, the notion of war crimes trials for, for Bosnia is something that, that is, um, goes back to the Nuremberg trials, but itself, I think, is an important step towards international intervention in, in national affairs so that, so that the, um, the boundaries between nation states and the rest of the world are becoming more, more porous. We can now, it's now very difficult for a nation state to conceal from the rest of the world what it's doing. We can know almost instantaneously um, if some uh, uh, serious atrocities or injustices are being perpetrated. Eric Hobson, do you see that the globalisation which you spoke of at the beginning of the programme, do you, do you see that as an inexorable process and what consequences flow from that in your view? It's inexorable in certain respects. Clearly, technology, science, the economy, communications, in all these respects, it can't be stopped. On the other hand, the idea that everything is being globalized is plainly mistaken. There is no equivalent tendency in politics for globalization. Um, and consequently, you have... Uh, States, politics, if you like, coexisting in a period of globalization. Um, the idea that the state will somehow or other wither away, uh, there is no justification for. Um, nevertheless, the peculiarity of the situation is that we are living with both at the same time. Let me give you the example which in some ways most typical of globalization today, and that's football. Hmm? Uh, football today represents both the uh, mass identification with a particular nation or state and the extremes of globalization. Yeah? Um, after all, probably the one way in which most people try and envisage what it means to be English, Scots, <coughs> Welsh, Nigerian, Benin or something is through their team. And at the same time, as we know, economically speaking, the football industry is absolutely typical of the modern development of global capitalism, you see, in which, in fact, teams, particular teams... Uh, which are to some extent in conflict with the, the, the national aspect of football, are recruited from people anywhere in the world, moving around the world anywhere, developing exactly the same extraordinarily inequalities of power and wealth. Uh, now, in effect, this seems to me typical of the situation of globalization. We have <coughs> both at the same time. We have both international competition and uh, 
through mechanisms which are purely global, which have nothing to do with them, which to some extent even undermine it. Uh, that seems to me to be the essence of the problem. There's a fear, Richard Hemmings, that... Uh I enjoyed that football analogy, <laughs> but a lot of people did. There's a fear, Richard Evans, that, that the globalisation is simply out of control. It's not only accelerating, it's, uh, it's accelerating recklessly, uh, and that how do you regulate it? How do you stop things going from one nation to another, <coughs> work, huge businesses suddenly flitting away to Asia and flitting away to <coughs> the Far East and so on? Uh, do you see it as... Uh, what's your view about that? Do you think it's out of control? It's certainly proving very difficult for governments to control um, their own economies. We've seen that in, in the current case of, of BMW and, and, and Rover. It's simply impossible for the, the British government, uh, apparently, to have any control over what BMW has, has been doing with Rover. And on a much larger scale, of course, the, um, as you said, the uh, relocation of, of industries to areas where there's cheap labour in the world. Um, is something that, that looks as if it's set to continue. The um, uh, only thing I would say about that in, in, um, as a kind of caveat is, is to do with automation, that, that automation um, is something that we don't know how far that is going to go. We don't know when the age of robots is going to um, migrate from the car factories to, um, uh, to the home and so on. And that may be some kind of break on the, on the mobility of, of, of labour. But globalisation, I think, is one of the big... Um, Themes of the of the next century, which is going to require a lot of discussion, a lot of um, a lot of debate. It's it's also the case, of course, globalization of culture is another thing. That the global homogenization of culture, the very rapid spread of English as the world language, to the extent now that um, uh, the learning of foreign languages in this country is in a state of collapse in the schools and 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 increasingly so in the universities, because it no longer seems necessary for people to learn foreign languages, and and, and uh, everywhere now people. Are Speaking, uh, speaking English, and that, I think, will look as if it's set to, to continue. As we come up for the final five minutes and the final half hour programme, because we're three quarters of an hour next week, um, hey, Holzman, can I ask you, do you see, you talked at the very beginning about the 20th century being a century of secular religions. Do you see, uh, the, 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 do you think that in the 20th century we were so burned by ideology that the great ideologies, he was great ironically, are, uh, might be... Nothing <laughs> might be a thing of the past. Uh, no, obviously not, because, I mean, having ideas about the world is, you might say, part of being human. Uh, we may not have the same ideas about the world, and they may not be have the same mobilising functions <coughs> as they had in the 19th and 20th century, but that doesn't mean that there won't be secular ideologies and that they won't have a mobilising function, but exactly how is a different matter. Uh, well, in, the 20th, sorry, in the I... 20th century, if you like, the great mobilising mechanism was politics. People thought these things would be done, any major changes, through people getting together in organisations and movements and aiming through the control of states to do it. In the 21st century, it doesn't follow that it's going to be in quite the same way. But how it's going to be is by no means so clear. I mean, do you see, you were a member of the Communist Party, do you see that that ideology as, as, as completely spent, or do you think that around the basic ideas inside that, there will be movements and ideologies which will uh, regenerate? An ideology of uh, social justice, if you like equality, is bound to remain simply because inequality is increasing at such an extraordinary extent far faster than before. It's mitigated by the fact that fewer people actually die of starvation, which was a thing which always used in the, in the, in, in the past, uh, which was a bottom line. Well, it's less of a bottom line now, except in a few places. But while the world is getting visibly more un, unequal, uh, it seems to me ideologies for equality and for justice cannot fail to appeal. What's your view on this, Richard? I mean, do you think that we have been through the age of ideology, just like we went through the age of religious wars, and that is now past us? Something else may surface, but that, that particular sort of secular ideology, ideology is past. Uh, I, I, do, I think you have to um, remember what we mean by the 20th century, and, and Eric, I think, in his, his books, has um, very 
um, well uh, delimited the 20th century, mm. as it were, from, 19, from the First World War to the fall of communism. It doesn't coincide with the years 1900 and, 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 and 2000. Um, and it's really that age from the First World War up to 1945 or so that's the real, I think, age of, of extreme ideologies which mobilise people in a fanatical sense in Europe uh, that, we, that hasn't been the case since. But uh, on the other hand, of course, um, uh, when communism fell, an American um, political scientist, Francis Fukuyama, predicted that everybody would become liberal democrats in the world, and this, this hasn't happened. Um, what we have seen, among other things, is the rise of religious fundamentalism, and not just uh, Muslim and Hindu fundamentalism, but also Christian fundamentalism in parts of the USA. So in and Jewish sense, fundamentalism. Uh, in, in, uh, in Israel, indeed, so that, uh, and America. So um, that, I think, does show that, that um, ideologies which demand a kind of... Um, a very powerful extreme commitment are by no means dead. You come uh, in your book, there are a, a personal line in it as well, but can I just ask finally, Eric Hobson, you've written about the disappearance of the notion of delayed gratification as one of the things that will affect the future of capitalism. Is it possible briskly just to explain that a little further? It seems to me that uh, capitalism, everything today in the period, has been based, to some extent, has operated on the heritage of the past, often quite a remote past. Rules among these things, having long horizons, family solidarities, com communal solidarities and so on, are, are things which have made it work. These things, in my view, have been disappearing in the past 30, 40 years, particularly since the 1960s and in doing so have made even the operation of the very economic system more difficult, more unpredictable, more fluctuating, uh, and to some extent more pathological. The idea that, for instance, we should have... the economy should depend on the short-term fluctuations of share prices is completely novel uh, in the history of modern capitalism. Do you agree that this, there's this sea change there, Richard Evans? Um, I think that's part of the kind of increasing pace of, of, of modern life and the more that we get into instantaneous global communications and so on, the more I think that is the more short-termism there's going to be about the way we see things and the, the, simply in terms of employment. Um, there's an increasing insecurity of jobs. People are more and more likely to shift quickly from one job to the other. And the, the notion that somebody is going to uh, stay 40 years in the same job as Eric did at Birkbeck College in, in London, I think is becoming increasingly outdated. Well, thank you both very much. Thanks, Eric Hobsbawm. Thanks, Richard Evans. Thanks for listening. Back next week at 45 minutes. As before, a again, in the past, uh, education, literacy, was something which was a minority activity, except among certain special groups. Secondary education was a tiny fraction. Tertiary education, students, ridiculous. I mean, when we talk about the students' role in the 1848 revolution, we're talking about three, 4,000 people in Europe, or at least in Germany. Today, we, we are in a completely different ballgame. And therefore, the past, though it gives us some guide, only gives us a very, very partial guide. Richard Evans, can we distinguish uh, different sorts of the past, as it were? Presumably in law we learn from the past, common law, that case is based on the previous case and so the next case. Has humanity ever really learned from the past and been able to apply the lessons? They've always tried. Uh, in the past, of course, uh, people learnt because there was a mechanism by which, in effect, uh, knowledge of the past and how things were done in the past... Uh, was passed on from one generation to the other, and until the 19th and 20th century, basically that was a model of how things should happen, at least for most ordinary people. So to that extent, learning from the past was built in, almost wired into uh, human life. The novelty of the situation that we have to discuss is, in the 19th and 20th century, when the future simply is not based on the on the past. We, we, we don't repeat. It's going to be very different. Hello. The 21st century is only a few months old, yet already the first history has been written. The eminent historian Eric Hobsbawm's book, The New Century, comes out next week. But is it really possible for history to tell us something about an era which has hardly begun?
Can we ever predict the future by understanding the past, often used as the justification for studying history? Should we seek to understand the past because it holds important lessons for the future? Or is history, as Henry Ford would have it, more or less bunk? With me to discuss the history of the future is Richard J. Evans, Professor of Modern History at the University of Cambridge, and author, among much else, of that clarion call of a book, In Defence of History, and I'm also delighted to welcome Eric Hobsbawm himself. Eric Hobsbawm, in a new century you've written, let us hope that the 20th, 21st century will experience further progress, but without the catastrophes. But if there are catastrophes, they'll be different as a result of the 20th century. Uh, is answered accordingly. That's one way we learn from the past, which accretes. There are certain ways in which we do learn from the past because of that sort of process. Can you distinguish ways in which you think we, we are learning from the past and ways in which we're taking a flyer? Well, even in law, I think um, judges of, uh, and people have always been fairly creative in interpreting precedents. Uh, I remember there's a, a legal definition in the Middle Ages in England of custom from time immemorial that says uh, that it's anything that's been going on for more than 21 years, I think. <laughs> um, so I don't think one should, should uh, uh, underestimate the extent to which people in the past have been able to adapt and, and, and change. But there's, there's no doubt that things are, are moving faster, that, that, as Eric says, education, literacy, globalization of communications, the instantaneous nature virtually different. And we've got to try and find out how it's going to be different. When you say the future isn't it, can you just extrapolate a little more on that before we go on? Well, <clears throat> let's put it like this. For most of the world, say until the middle of the 20th century, the greater part of humanity lived on the land and by agriculture, one way or another. Even the big industrial countries, with one or two exceptions of England, the United States, Germany, a very high percentage of the people continue to be in the country. Today, this is simply no longer so. It is a purely regional problem. We've got to get used to a future in which only 2 3%, even less of people live uh, by farming, by agriculture, where the country, countryside is completely different from what it ever 